Welcome to podcast number nine of Bass Talk with Hagen and Hayes. Today's topic is musicians who have influenced us. So, Susan Hagen, good afternoon. How are you? I'm good, David Hayes. How are you? Very well, thank you. So tell me about the musicians who influenced you. Oh, boy. I, another. This is such another good topic. I love these topics. Um, you know... In the beginning, I would say when I was a kid, it was my family because they're all musicians. And I know that seems like just a sappy answer, but my mom was my first piano teacher. My dad was my first bass teacher. My sisters both played the violin. One of them still plays professionally. And the other one is still also a musician. Um, she's she's a music director at of a church music program. So... I was surrounded by music and my my mom's dad was a saxophone player in a dance band. And I have to say that my earliest influences would have been that and a couple of silly little pop bands that I would have listened to as a kid. Uh, anyone who ever has listened to any of my recitals, the Norwegian band, Aha, uh -huh, still <laughs> totally obsessed with them. Haven't, out, haven't outgrown them. <laughs> but then then I became a bass player, right? And so then your influences shift. And I think the first solo playing I ever heard was Gary Carr. And I think a lot of us can say that. And I remember thinking, I didn't know the bass could play that high, that vocally, um, you know, with all the arias that he would transcribe and, and that were already transcribed that I didn't even know about. Um, it was very exciting. And Still, though, I was I was a little bit isolated. I didn't know a lot about bass soloists or anything like that, even when I got to college. And so at that point, I would have said, oh, my biggest influence is definitely Ed Barker, who is the principal bass player of the Boston Symphony. And I'm one of maybe two or one people that has studied with him for a prolonged period. I did my bachelor's and master's degree with him. He wasn't exactly the type of player that... He would say, listen to other players, but he wouldn't give names. I think he didn't want to show favoritism. Um, mm. He'd just say, listen to other bass players, listen to other recordings, listen to cellists. He would give us a lot of cellists to listen to. Um, but I never found any of them make it into my, you know, top 20 list of favorite artists because I think it's the cello. I love the cello, but I didn't ever want to play it. So listening to cellists was not exactly like what I was striving to sound like. I know that sounds horrible. Um, but, you know, the list is, it's now varied. I love Renat Abramov's playing. Mm. Um, the first time I ever heard his Bodicini concerto, I'd already performed it with an orchestra three or four times. And I remember thinking, who is this person? This is the same interpretation I have. Mm. And and then I, you know, then I backfilled the information of who he was, uh, yeah. but I had never heard of him before, which just shows how isolated I was in the bass world. Um, but now it's a much, it's a much bigger list. But now what about you? It started, um, you, you said with your family, it started with my teachers. Mm. I think all my teachers have influenced me. And I, I, I was, I've been really lucky because each one has given me something different. Um, and they've each one helped me move a step forward and another step forward. And my second teacher, Lawrence Gray, um, he knew Bronwyn Nash, who studied with Gary Carr. And Bronwyn lived in North Wales and organised a summer school every year. So when I was about 17 or 18, I went to her summer school. And again, it, it changed my life. It was fantastic. Suddenly you had 25 bass players playing all these Gary Carr exercises, vomit. Mm -hmm. for. Um, I, I can't remember how many oxes we played it, but it, it, it seemed like about 30 minutes, this one exercise. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it, it was, But just to be able to, in the same room with all these players was so fantastic. So Bronwyn was a great influence. And the fact that she was also a soloist, that influenced me because she started with Gary, so therefore she played a lot of his repertoire. Um, and she had a real lyricism, a, a really beautiful sound to her playing, which was, which was really good. And then when I was, I think I was about 18, I, I came out to London for a, a lesson and I had a bit of time. So I, I went uh, down Gower Street near the British Museum and I bought the record and it was Ludwig Stryker plays Botticini, which I, I probably mentioned before. Yes. And that one record changed my life. And 
I'd, I'd seen all this Botticini music. I don't know I'd ever heard anybody play it, really, mm. when I look back. And suddenly this man was playing it. And on the front, he was standing there with this Viennese bass. And I fell in love with it, the shape of this Viennese bass. Yeah. And it took me then another 30 years before I, I actually found one, which was nice. And then a little bit later, um, the Czech Music Information Centre in Prague sent me a big package of music and, and one record, and that was Francis Jack Costa. Yes. And I'd, I'd met Sarah, my wife, by then, Sarah's a singer, and I put the record on. And within about a minute, she said, he's the one. He's the one to go and study with, because she could recognise the lyricism in his play, which is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so Frank was was an early influence and really still is. It, it's, it's amazing how it hasn't changed. And Stryker is... His record, the, the Botticini record, I'm not sure it's been bettered. I think the playing is, is maybe better nowadays. But what he did in the 1970s was absolutely astounding for his time. And it, it's so all these players, I, I don't know they've changed. And Francois Robath and Bert Turetsky commissioned so many pieces. Bert and I are still, still friends. I wrote to him on Saturday. I sent him a, a new piece I've written dedicated to him. Um, yes. So I, I've been lucky to be influenced by so many people. And then what about other bass players since then for you? Well, you know, it's funny because as you're talking about your teachers, I I can't say that my early teachers were not a big influence. They were huge influences. Mm -hmm. My very first, so my dad was my first bass teacher. And then I briefly went to study with my sister's violin teachers because my dad said, I don't want to lead you wrong. You've got to, you know, I had an audition for a local youth orchestra. And he said, let's let someone else, you know, help you. When I got into that youth orchestra, the the coach there was a woman named, well, her name is now Mary, Mary Olds. She's gotten married and her last name has changed. Um, That's at the time, yeah, it often does, <laughs> except for Sarah and myself. <laughs> but um, Mary was, she was super laid back, very kind, really a little bit of like a quiet personality, but I hung on her every word and she would study with Ed Barker. And I think that's where the, I want to study yeah. with Ed Barker thing came from. She would save up from my lessons with her every, every few, she yeah. would then go and take a lesson with him and then she'd pass yeah. his teachings on to me. Yeah. And she was so kind and supportive and really, really nice. And she, for her, a big thing was posture and mm -hmm. physical health when you're playing the bass. Um, Cause she had had some bass related injuries. And I think she's the reason why the only time during the course of my day that I have good posture mm -hmm. is when I'm playing the bass. The rest of the time I <laughs> slouch. My, oh my gosh, my posture is just very not good. Just sitting up now. But, yeah, I, me too. <laughs> But Mary helped me to have great posture. She moved to Chicago um, for my last two years of high school, and she handed me off to a woman named Pascal Delache Feldman. Mm -hmm. Pascal's from France, Paris, and she went to Curtis, and she shocked me because she showed me that, you know, the bass could be more of a solo instrument than I'd ever noticed and she and her husband Emmanuel had a duo still have a duo and you know cello and bass music and mm. chamber music I suddenly realized was something that we could play and she was she was also very kind to me she brought me a gift one day I, I was sick and in the hospital one summer and she came to visit me and she brought me a cd of Ray Brown and I oh. thought who is this person? This is not classical music. And um, the Orchestra of Contrabasses from France yes, yeah. brought me two of their CDs. Back in the day, they were CDs, right? And I thought, wow, eight bass players playing together. It sounded so cool. There were sound effects and all these things I'd never thought of before. Um, she really influenced me in many, many ways. And she encouraged me to go to a master class <laughs> that Ed Barker was giving. Mm. And this this guy named Greg Keller, who was a, a big player in, in Boston, now he's in the Bergen Philharmonic. Right. Um, he was playing the Botticini second concerto. And I went with my best friend, Maureen, and we were sitting there and I listened to the piece. And I looked at my friend and I said, I cannot die until I get to play this piece. I have to learn this piece. That was the piece that, and that was the performance that made yes. me decide I had to be a bass player. Um, and so I think all of these people really influenced me and they may not be like, you know, 
the hugest names, but to me, they were my base world. Um, and it was funny because the the guy who played the Bodicini, when I was in college, I took some lessons with him during the summer yes. one year. And he said to me, you know, I, I was of the mindset of I must win an orchestra job or else I have no career. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, you can freelance. It's an option. And yes. I looked at him probably with a big, stupid, dumb look on my face. And he said, I freelance and I make plenty of money to pay my bills and I'm very happy. And he said to me, and I don't have to work with all the same people every single day. I like the flexibility. And I thought, oh, this is a possibility. So Greg had a lot of influence on me in his own way also. Um, and in Boston, we tend to be, well, we have the Boston Symphony, right? And it consists of some of what I think is maybe some of the finest bass playing, definitely in this country, possibly in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Ed Barker and Larry Wolf, who are on the first stand, mm -hmm are incredibly influential. And so when I was in college, I looked no further than that BSO bass section. So again, for many years, I never really thought of other people outside mm -hmm. of Boston, not just outside of America, but outside of Boston, because I had some really good people to look up to right, right there, you know, in the same, in the same town. But as I've gotten older, <laughs> I've been hearing more players, more composers. Um, I mean, honestly, you've been a huge influence. And I know you're going to think I'm just kissing up to you. But no, when I first discovered your music, I thought, wow, is this the sound worlds and the colors and beautiful melodies and just such gorgeous music. Thank you. That's it's been sort of a bit of a pivot for for my bass playing, just a, a point where I've said, hey, look at me. I want to play recitals because look at all this great music and, you know, recital music mm. that that is your your publishing company. They're just so much wonderful music that I suddenly came out of my I only play orchestral music mindset and have been. I mean, how many recitals have I given since the lockdown? Probably close to 10 or more. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's so I would have to put you in the group of bass players that has I been influenced. Yeah, well, wrong. it's true, <laughs> though. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And in my students, they're so funny because they're like, do you have another David Hayes piece for me? <laughs> and and I say to them, are you getting sick of them? And they say, no, I'm not. They love it, too. And and oh, your God. latest the creations you're 40 at 40 that you're doing mm. slightly less tonal than some of your other pieces but i was just teaching one of them to one of my students just yesterday and i said to him just because it's atonal doesn't mean it's not beautiful i think i said to you there should be a subtitle you did. You did. i was really very kind of you but it's it's so funny when i was writing the hertel pieces they were really quite lyrical um and quite tonal it, it's completely different and yet these ones are coming out quite atonal which is I hadn't intended it at all, but it's um, it's just how it happened. It's, it's really strange. Yeah. It, yeah. And it, it's interesting you were saying about living in a city, because I think in a city it's different. And I came yeah. from the countryside and right. um, it was completely different. But I, I was very lucky that from an early age, I was surrounded by people who played solo bass. Yes. And that influenced me. And I, I started buying records almost as soon as I started playing the bass. So I, mm. I was passionate about it right from the start and and Robin had started with Gary so she played as a soloist and I heard Gary play and then I went to the uh, Isle of Man competition in 1982 and heard so many other people play um and I, I always thought I was going to be an orchestral player right because that was the there were, well certainly in Britain there were two paths as a bass player mm -hmm. either in an orchestra or you taught there was no no other paths um, so so I, I sort of went down the orchestral path, but I, I learned very quickly that wasn't for me. That, that <laughs> really, there are many others can do the job better um, and would want to do it. But I, I think I, I think I found where I should be. So I've, I've been lucky. I've been influenced by by so many great people, and I, and I enjoy working with so many great people. Yeah. Um, I had a, a fantastic director of music when I was at school, a lady called Barbara Senior, mm -hmm. and she'd studied at the Royal Academy of Music in London. She was a pianist. And then she'd become director of music. Um, and she, she was lovely. She didn't have children, um, but she had very nurturing, very caring. And she always used to take a couple of us under her wing. You know, she, mm. she gave us a little bit more than, than she gave the others. And, and I always remember my, my bass teacher at the time, Lawrence, wanted me to go and study um, locally, um, you know, 30 miles away. 
and I, I mentioned this to Barbara and she said no not a hope in hell she said mm -hmm. you go to London and you don't come back she said I made the mistake of coming back and I never got away again mm. uh, wow that's good advice so I tell my students now you know wherever you live let's let's say you live in I don't know in Bournemouth or mm. in, in Peabody and <laughs> Peabody might be the best place in the world but go and look at the world first mm. and then then you come back to Peabody and say yeah, I've looked at the world and it's fantastic, but you're right, Peabody is still the best place in the world to <laughs> yes. live. And I, I just think it's a, a big world nowadays. And I think it's it there's so many possibilities. And I, yeah. with my students, I always got them to listen to different players. Yes. I would tell them why they were listening to that. Player. Or also, the, there were certain players I would say, listen to, and I'll tell you why you're listening to them. And it's not for the right reasons. It's not good. Um, yes. But they have to know. And and then eventually they would come in and say, ah, oh, now I understand what you're saying, why you're mentioning that that player, what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. Yes. Like that. But I, I've been very lucky. I've been surrounded by by many great people. Teppo Hatao was my great friend for a nearly, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And mm -hmm. we both studied together with Poshta, Rantashev Poshta in Prague. Teppo, 1960s, I was there in the 1980s. So we had this joint love of posture and the singing double bass. Um, and te uh, Teppo is a great influence, really, uh, partly with my, my composition. Yes. Because he opened up the possibilities of, of what we can do on the bass, still in a tonal and traditional way. But it's just pushing the bounds a little bit. And I, I've enjoyed writing music for younger players where I could introduce all the different effects so even though they might just be playing in first position, they can learn about bass percussion or they yes. can learn about colenio or sul ponticello yeah. or, um, you know, so many different ways of doing it. And yeah. there's one piece, I, I think you've taught it a few times, the one where you have to stamp. Oh, they love it. And, and the George pieces. And yes. a part of the reason for that was to teach about balancing the bass if you're a stander. Right. Uh, which is a, a really good thing. But also learning about about the weight of where you put the weight because you can't stamp if the weight's in the wrong place right right it, and you know what i have to tell you the the adventures of george that first book of pieces there's left hand pizzicato there's coleno there's sul ponticello there's the stamping there's tapping there's so many different effects my students get completely excited by the fact that they're not just playing you know low position what what we lovingly call the farty part of the bass um <laughs> they're playing something musical and they're learning the effects and of course i do say to them back in my day you know when you walked uphill both ways to school um <laughs> we didn't learn this stuff until you'd been playing bass for five or six years probably um but i think i think our early influences really impact us like for you you had access to or you sought out solo recordings mm. you know bass players playing solo repertoire I started and buying, yeah i started buying them when i was still at school but they, yeah. it was so difficult to get a hold of these things it, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, I remember i wrote to gary carr i, I think he was in uh, nova scotia at the time i got his okay. address from bronwyn uh, to find out about all his recordings and he sent me this lovely uh, this this letter and, and a list of recordings um, and where I could buy them from. And in those days, everything was so different. You had to write. And I used to yes. write to this company and say, I'd like to buy these, these records. How much are they? Then they send me a letter back saying how much. And then oh. I had to go to the bank and then I had to get a bank transfer and I'd have to send that. And so it'd take a month or something, yeah. six weeks to be able to yeah. get these records. But I, I started buying all his records. And then I studied in London and suddenly there were many record shops in London. Oh, sure. Specialist yeah. ones. So I, I was able to go and buy all these records. So I, I knew a lot about bass playing. And I would go to every bass recital. And even if I didn't like it, there would be things I would learn. You know, I, there right. might be things I'd never heard before. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wow, I, I like that one. Or, or I'd hit, hear two pieces played together. I thought, oh, they, they don't go so well together, those two. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Or they do go well together. You yep. know, it, it, you learn it, about programming. Yeah. And so I, I think I was, I've been influenced by lots of people. And I, I like the fact that I haven't stopped learning. That's uh, one of the great things about our career. I yeah, I think if you stop learning, I think you you just stop growing. You just stop being a a musician. And I, I I try and instill in my students this, this love of learning, and and never stopping. And that's what I enjoy. There's there's always something new to learn. 
if it's in bass or just music, you know, it could be a symphony I've learned or a composer. We've got a, a composer on Radio 3 this week, Composer of the Week, uh, a French composer. I, I, I can't remember her name. I'm really sorry. But <laughs> lady I'd never heard of really beautiful music. And he said, wow, there's something else I can now start researching. Yeah. I, I had one student, Alex Heather. Alex won't be listening to this because he won't be interested. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's just... I'm graduated. tagging him now. Yeah, he's it? just graduated from the Royal College of Music. And he was from uh, New York and he yeah. came to study with me in Wells until he was 18. And I have to say he was an influence on me. He mm -hmm. was a great influence because he's got a, a, a technical brain and he can come up with 10 different fingerings for every passage, passage of music. He's yes. really an absolutely amazing character. And then we'd, we'd go through, you know, half a dozen of the fingerings and say why that one isn't, isn't so good maybe why that one is is possible or or everything but he he had that analytical brain and i i now see when i'm working at things i'm i'm using alex's analytical brain and going beyond how i used to play and he's really opened up the possibilities i'm i'm so grateful i think i learned as much from him as he learned from me um well, he, he was a, a great student most i think the most naturally gifted student I think I've ever taught. I've had many, many great students, but he had the most natural ability of any student. But when he, he first came, he was only playing, I think, Chimador. You know, he was, mm. he was nothing nothing special at all. Uh, but he and I just hit it off just so well. He, he He's such a, I think, one of the nicest people I've ever met. He's, mm. he's got a heart of gold. He wouldn't hurt anybody. He wouldn't say the wrong thing. He's a great musician. He's a great player. He, he works so hard. You know, so any success he has, he, he really deserves. But he he influenced me. I'm, I'm not sure if I ever told him that. Um, He'll find out because I'm totally going to tag him in this. <laughs> I bet I didn't influence him at all. So <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. So but this is the interesting thing. Our students influence us. Um, th it goes both ways. I say to my students, yes. my plan is, this, the expectation is that I will continue learning. And if there is a day when I stop learning, just roll me into the grave because I'm dead. Yes. Yeah. Or I should be. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, and... and my my students influence me some in good ways some in ways of like i don't want to do that but most of the time i learn great things from them mm. sometimes it's different approaches to you know oh i never would have thought of playing a passage that way or phrasing it that way but it's legitimately good um and sometimes the students played one of my pieces <gasps> and i think yes. it was much slower than i'd anticipated yes. it uh much slower than I, I played it or taught it and i I suddenly rethought it. Wow, I love it. it it's, yes. I can't remember which piece it was. Was it, was it Lullaby? It was, yes, it was Lullaby. Oh. And I think it might have been Gabe. Um, yeah. But it was someone this past spring. It was really slow, but absolutely gorgeous. I was yeah. so, and that, that's what I like, even though I'd written the piece. <laughs> I, I still, yeah. I'm still happy to, to listen to other interpretations. Um, yeah. And just, oh, yeah, that's, that's possible. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. And it's yep. nice to rethink. It is. And I remember him saying specifically, well, this is a lullaby, so I feel it should be a little mm -hmm. relaxed. And I said to him, you are the artist. And I say this to my mm -hmm. students. This is your interpretation. I'll always tell you if you're going way off the mark here, but I want to give, I try to give them the opportunity to create mm -hmm. the, the sound that they want to. Um, but, you know, it's interesting I I think you and I do the same thing. I have my students listen to recordings and sometimes I point them in the directions of people to listen to. And sometimes I'll mention like, don't play like this, but do listen to it type of a thing. Yes. I always say to my students, beware of YouTube because anyone can post anything. I remember I had a student who I just, you know, I wasn't getting through to him. He, he wouldn't practice scales. He wouldn't practice any of the, what I find to be the technical building blocks of what we need, but he really wanted to play the Bach cello suites. Yes. And I remember saying, okay, I'll let you learn a movement. Basically I, I was bargaining that if you can master these particular two major, two octave scales, like, ugh. and he just wouldn't, he wouldn't practice the scales. And I said to him, you know what? I don't think we're the right fit. I think, you know, I sort of did the lesson breakup. I said, I think you might want to find a different teacher. And he was like, yeah. I do. I want to find a teacher who will let me play Bach right now. And I thought, good luck to you. So he, he went his merry way. And about two weeks later, a video surfaced on YouTube of him playing a movement of a Bach cello suite. 
And he said, I haven't been working on this long, but I'm super proud of where it's, where it's gone. Well, it went into like five different keys just in the first two lines. And I thought, well, this is exactly why I didn't think that you were ready for this piece. So, you know, I say to my students, um, anyone can post on YouTube. So be listen with a critical ear. And um, I remember when I would go, you know, CD shopping, we would go, we had a great Tower Records in Boston when I was in college, even in high school, oh, on dates on the weekends, a whole bunch of us would pile into a car and, and head into Boston, go to Tower Records. They had an entire floor of classical music, which you didn't get anywhere else. And I remember at first I would get the, the recordings I could afford. And those would be like, you know, one step away from Joe's garage band. So, and I'd think, well, at least I'm learning what the Mozart symphonies sound like. And um, we had Columbia records and tapes you could mail away for one penny. You'd get 15 free recordings of your choice, but then you had to like buy X number in the next couple yes. of years. And they, it seemed like a great idea because it was a front loaded bargain. But at the end, you're like hemorrhaging money to the company. <laughs> But, oh, you know, yeah. oh, right. But yeah. you start off and you're like, you know, these little rinky dink orchestras and they're quite terrible, but you figure it was close to free. So it was OK. And then I started getting snobby and I'd be like, I want the Chicago <laughs> with Schulte box set of Beethoven symphonies. But that might be the best box set of Beethoven symphonies I've still ever heard in my life. Um but I had access to orchestral music easily, mm -hmm. the recordings. My parents had a great collection of records, of LPs at our house. Um, they used to tape the Boston Symphony recordings off the radio. So we had cassette tapes, right. shelves and shelves of them. If I wanted to hear what Berlioz Symphony Fantastique sounded like, that's one of their signature pieces, I would go and I would, I would hear it. So I had access to a ton of orchestral music. And I think that's also part of why I was headed in the I want to be an orchestral player direction in the beginning of my career. Now I just want to play music I love. <laughs> um, but I think that I think we're influenced by so many things. Oh, my favorite conductor, Rafael Frubeck de Burgos. Mm -hmm. He I did Symphony Fantastique with him. I did all the Strauss tone poems with him. And every time he came onto the, the stage, I would just be so excited because he was a musical mastermind and he could just do the slightest little flicker of his hand and the whole orchestra knew what to do. And they'd always play, you know, the most beautiful. I've played with the Boston Symphony with him so many times before he passed. And it was always the richest, fullest sound of that time period for, from that orchestra would be when he was conducting. Um, I think Anders gets a great sound out of the orchestra at this point in time too. But um, I it's just interesting, think... isn't it? Because I think it's throughout our, our musical lives, we've been influenced by so many different people. And I think yeah. each one um, helps us to push forward to really yes. who we are and, and create yes. the person, the musician that we've become. Absolutely. I think it's not just bass players. And mm -hmm. I think it's not always just classical players, but it's, it's teachers and friends and sometimes is someone that was on a recording um it and it can be absolutely anyone that influences us and sometimes it's the cautionary tale of don't do this but most of the time it's oh listen to this beautiful sound that someone on some instrument in some genre of music is making and so i'd love that for both of us the musicians have influenced us are not necessarily bass players mm. i think that's cool Yes, yeah, I, I, I've really loved working with so many great people and, and yeah. so many people have influenced me in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it's incalculable, really, how, how many people are involved in, in our careers, even though we don't, yeah. don't realise it. It's, it's really nice. And hopefully we're the same with our students. Hopefully yes. we're influential in their lives and their careers, helping them to take the next step forward. And I hope I'm not always the cautionary tale for them of what not to do. <laughs> but I, I remember. Say to <laughs> Sorry, I, I always yeah. say to my students, it's don't worry, I'll get you a good bass teacher one day. Until then, <laughs> you have to put up with me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not very good. I'm doing my best. I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sure they love that. Well, I remember a couple of years ago, you sent me a list of questions. It was like a little um, written interview yeah, yeah. and it was, you know, who are your, your yeah. influences? And I remember I filled it out and then I didn't send it to you because I was sort of feeling shy and like, who would even want to read a, an interview from me? Um, and then I looked at it again, like a few months later and all of my answers had changed. And I, and I think that's kind of the exciting thing about being a musician. Mm. You keep maturing or, or at least growing <laughs> and meeting new people, hearing new things. And I think not just your list of influences changes. I think your style and your tastes change. And and again, you know, when when all of that stops happening, just roll me into the grave. It's done. <laughs> Fine, we will. Thank, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening to Base Talk with Hagen and Hayes. Be sure to check out our new landing pad website of uh, basetalk.com. Uh, Oh, I know we're, we're getting fancy here. Uh, like, um, leave comments. Tell us who are your influences. I'm actually curious to know what other people have as their list of influences and it subscribe. Yeah, it would well, be great. Uh, subscribe yeah. to our YouTube channel. You'll get little, uh, you know, information when we release new things. And also we always have contests. So thank <laughs> you to our supporters and sponsors. And I hope everybody stays well. Let's talk to you next time. Bye.